it's wonderful to see so many people here today, which leads me to my first thought at the launch of the, this book uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Savage Club. Geoffrey Blaney spoke and he pointed out that uh, the history of the Western District used to be very much front and centre in uh, Australian history, that uh, not, certainly no Victorian uh, student of history would go through university without uh, learning a fair bit about it. And uh, yet, in recent years, it's, you know, it's almost faded completely from, from sight. And it's, it's fascinating that three of the absolute classic local histories that have been written in Australia uh, are about the Western District. And I mean Margaret Kittle's Men of Yesterday, uh, J.M. Powell's The Public Lands of Australia Felix, sounds a very dull title, but it is a brilliant book, and Jan Critchett's A Distant Field of Murder. Um, all, you know, absolute classics in their field. Um, the Western District was also um, the subject of one of the very best tertiary history subjects that I've ever seen, um, which is Jan Critchett and Gordon Forth's marvellous um, Western District local history course that they taught at um, the old Warrnambool Institute of Advanced Education, later taken over and trashed by Deakin University. Uh, but um, that was just a marvellous course and I had the um, privilege of teaching that myself for one semester, which I enjoyed enormously. And I learned more doing that than I, uh, <laughs> than probably in, um, uh, the rest of my life put together. Um, but today, we generally hear very little about the Western District, except in terms of Aboriginal dispossession. Uh, you know, that Jan Critchett's book, which was the first really in that field, in, in that area, you know, has very much opened up a whole field of, of historical research, but that is very much the sole focus of Western District history and has been now for a generation. Um, and while that is certainly a big story, it's not the only story, and in terms of how the Western District came to be as it is today, uh, we have to look well beyond that. And so I was delighted to see Maggie's um, book on Neil Black um, because I doubt that if you, if you look at Melbourne, uh, at uh, history students today, I doubt if one in 50 could tell you what the selection acts were uh, and yet they, they shaped how Victoria is today. Um, and even fewer probably understand the importance of the wool industry, which is what we lived on until the 1980s. Um, when I read Maggie's book, I, I was most impressed with the way it showed such a vivid and balanced picture of European settlement of the Western District. Uh, it covers you know, every aspect. It, it covers the story of Ab Aboriginal dispossession, the battle of the lands that dominated the 1850s and 1860s, and then the final triumph of the squatters in the 1870s, um, you know, which led to the era in which they built their mansions and sent their children to Geelong Grammar or off to England to school and you know, created very much the, the picture of the Western District that we, that, uh, we have today. Um, the phrase men of yesterday comes from one of Neil Black's letters. Um, he used it to describe himself and his fellow squatters as early as 1864. He called it, you know, I, I'm a man of yesterday. Um, and this raises the issue of the sources that Maggie had to write the book. There were hundreds of squatters in Western Victoria in the 1830s and 40s, most of them now a little more than names. Some of them we know a bit more than that. But Neil Black, there was enough material to write a, a biography of, um, and a complete and comprehensive biography which gives a very rounded picture of the man and his times. So Maggie, how is it possible to, you know, how did the sources survive? Well, the sources, I mean, are absolutely legion. It must be one of the largest archives ever left by somebody of that kind, not just here, but anywhere. And um, I think there are various reasons. First of all, he himself, you know, he was backed by partners in, in Scotland and Liverpool who were of a much more socially elevated class. And he was very much, as it were, aware that he must write and you know, he'd gone off to the opposite end of the world with their money, and he must write back and tell them how he was getting on. And I think in the course of that, and he kept copies, he wrote everything out twice, until copying came in, which is about the late 1840s, 
1840s. So he kept, he kept these outgoing letter books. He not only kept his incoming, but he kept his outgoing correspondence. And he presumably needed to refer to it um, in, in, in what he'd already told them, etc. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is that in doing, writing all these letters, I think he developed a love affair with the pen. He has an incredibly powerful voice. You know, although his writing is very difficult to decipher, sometimes, you know, a whole afternoon can be rewarded by the discovery of some wonderful turn of phrase or some marvelous description, either of the landscape or of his fellow human beings or of his absolute rage on discovering that Foster Fiennes has yet again threatened to cancel his license, whatever. So that, I think, is very important. And towards the end of his life, he annotated it all. And all the letters that came in are all on their corners in his own writing, annotated, this arrived from so-and-so, this date, and so on. So he himself made sure, I don't know what he filtered out, he must have filtered some things out, but mainly he kept it all, warts and all. And I think that's another uh, characteristic of the resources, that you keep discovering things that most people would not like to be known about themselves, and he doesn't mind. So, you know, there it is, this voluminous archive, and it's, you know, for me, his great-granddaughter, you, you couldn't, as a writer, you couldn't ask for more. You really couldn't ask for more. Um, so, so how did it come to survive? Well... It survived uh, only due to uh, uh, my second cousin, once removed, I can't remember the relationship, Hope Black. She was married into a previous generation. And w during the war, they, the, apparently the government commissioned all scrap paper to be pulped. And she went down to the office of the company, of Black, as it was then, and Black Brothers, and uh, took the archive from the office and hid it in the loft at the stables. So she made this effort to save it. And after the war, Margaret Kittle came calling and, and Hope brought the archive down and they opened it up on the kitchen table. And I think that, you know, at that moment, men of yesterday stepped forward because he was very much, uh, that correspondence was very central in Margaret Kittle's work in her book. And um, I think therefore we have to owe it to Hope and to Margaret Kittle who then, campaigned like she did with many others of the Scotters' uh, archives to have them put in the State Library. And I think there were some bits that the family said were to be closed. They are now open, but it's quite amusing to discover what they thought ought to be closed and so on. So there it is, all 152 boxes of it. Yes, it, it, it is fascinating what people a generation or two uh, ago thought should be closed when I did a book on the values. There were many things that in the 1960s they didn't want talked about that you sort of think, well, why not? But um, you know, at the time they felt it very, very strongly, which is why a biography of W.L. Bailey wasn't done until now. Um, so, so who was Neil Black? Where did he come from? What was his background, his upbringing? Well, interestingly, we have nothing in Neil Black's hand until he arrives here. So the first thing in his hand is a journal that he began to keep the day he arrived in Sydney, he came Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Melbourne. And the day he arrived in Sydney to go and present himself to the governor, uh, use his introductions, etc. cetera, um, that was when he enters his first entry in his journal. And he was um, a tenant farmer in Argyllshire in an area called the Cowell Peninsula. Um, this is due west from Glasgow, across the Firth of Clyde, and he and his brothers were, there were nine children in the family. His father died in 1804 from a fall from his horse. No, 186 from a fall from his horse. Neil was only two. He was the last child. And um, they, his father had done well out of sheep. Neil exaggerates how well later in his correspondence, but he obviously had done well in the period when there had been a blockade during the Napoleonic Wars. And so the family did have some means, and, but in Scotland of those days, a tenant farmer was really nobody. They could be an improving tenant farmer, in which case they would come up in the world, but they couldn't possibly compete with the proprietorial class. The land was held still feudally in Scotland then. 
And so he uh, bridled under this situation. He was obviously intelligent. His education was not particularly special. I don't think it went beyond secondary school. Um, but he bridled under this, you know, limitation that he couldn't rise in the world. So I think when the stories came of Major Mitchell's expedition and the discovery of Australia Felix, he began to think, ah, this is going to be my chance in life. And he has to have been an impressive and persuasive man because in his mid-30s, he persuades these grand Glaswegian and Liverpool families to back him. And so Gladstone, his main partner, um, the one with whom he corresponded, became his mentor, but he's the one really, I think, who, uh, he met Neil's older brother on a boat. He was, a, uh, he was um, invited to shoot on the land of Finlay, and Gladstone and Finlay became the two main partners, and then one other, one of their uncles also joined in. So it's not a, it's a managerial upcoming person, but not a person, I mean, he must always have spoken with a Scottish accent, however honorable he became, he must always have been conscious that he says at one point, I live in the purgatory between the lot of a common farmer and that of a gentleman. This was in Scotland that he yeah. felt that. Yes, um, and his native language is Gaelic. I mean, he, he, he grew up speaking Gaelic. He would have uh, definitely grown up speaking Gaelic, but I think that was the language of hearth and field. He would have all business and anything to do with you know, money matters or cattle matters would have been conducted in English. Gaelic was actually abolished as a language of instruction after the 45 rebellion, 50 years before. So Gaelic hadn't died out, but it was very much uh, the hearth and the, the shepherd's language and so on. I think respectable families would have conducted their world in, mostly in English at that yeah. time. Yes, because I was interested that later on, a lot of his, um, the, the shepherds and workers that he brought out from Scotland were also Gaelic speakers. That's right, I think when they came, he would probably have to help them with the English. They would, obviously, at Glen Ormiston, probably to begin with, they mostly spoke Gaelic. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, so I think you've covered you know, his decision to come to Australia, but um, when he arrived, and you know, he arrived with the idea of setting up a run in, in Australia, Felix, what, what were his priorities in looking for a run? What sort of place was he, was he seeking? Well, he was somebody who definitely was looking for a good piece of land. A lot of the early squatters were younger than him, and they took their flocks of sheep, and they went off into the distant yonder, and when they'd eaten that grass, they moved. But he was always here for the long term. The run he took up had not been lived on by its owner before. It had just been under a manager. And so he, he went around, he rode everywhere, he went to look, everywhere, and of course he had a good eye for country, he knew about country, he'd after all spent his life tenanting land, being a livestock uh, developer, or whatever you'd call it, and so um, he knew what to look for, and I think when he saw, when he found Glenormiston, it was on the market because the, pre the manager had uh, massacred a sub-tribe of Aboriginal people, the Tanpir subgroup of the Kire people, and he... Um, the, he had then had to run away from the uh, protector of Aborigines who was making inquiries after him. He went off to Van Diemen's Land. And I think the owners in Melbourne thought, okay, sheep are very expensive now, good time to sell out, don't want to look for a new manager, so they put it on the market. So that was his luck, that he was managed not only to find this run, um, he went to inspect it, he wasn't gonna buy anything he hadn't inspected, but he was also a good negotiator, so he was able to you know, get the deal that he wanted as far as he could. Yeah. Yes, I thought your treatment generally of the issue of Aboriginal dispossession was, was very balanced and reasonable, um, you know, without trying to excuse the actions of the squatters. You, you've set out the reasons why they acted as they did. Um, I think historians today have a very strong tendency to judge the past by the standards of the, uh, of the present. Um, but how would you judge Neil Black's attitudes and actions towards the Aborigines by the standards of his time as by opposed the to the standards time. of the present? Well, I think um, this is obviously a very complex and difficult one, but um, one of the things was that he had come from Scotland. He had not come from Van Diemen's Land, and most of the other settlers surrounding him were from Van Diemen's Land, and they had had a very horrible 
and well-known experience, notorious experience in Van Diemen's Land vis-a-vis -vis the Aboriginal population. And Black had determined, uh, when he first arrived, he'd expected to take up new country. Then he realized, as he says, to, in order to take up new country, you are forced to slaughter natives right and left. And that he did not wish to do. He, he, he said he abided by the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. And so his attitude was that it would be better to take up a run where the job had already been done. He accepted that would inevitably, that it wouldn't be possible not to do that. He also, um, when he uh, it was on the run, he armed his shepherds and he instructed them to fire in the air. He always fired in the air himself and he rode up and down on his horse. He was an impressive man, rather like a conquistador, I think he thought of himself, riding up and down, scaring everybody away. And that was his policy. It was his policy was scare everybody away, keep them off your run. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to defend that either because obviously if you're dispossessed, your life and your future and your resources are destroyed. So we can't pretend that he didn't, you know, he was benign. He was not benign, but at least he didn't murder people. So um, on the other hand, I think the other thing that's important is that whatever attitude he may have arrived with, as he got to know the squatting fraternity, and they all relied on each other for stores, for drays, for this, for that, um, you know, they, they were, they were a, a, a band of brothers, and if other people did awful things, he, he was not going to stand in judgment on them. And sometimes, when it was a question of seeking uh, La Trobe or somebody's intervention for security, he would join in uh, letters that would, um, you know, uh, ask for this. And so I can't say that there were some things that he put his name to which really were, uh, were actually untrue. I don't think he knew that they were untrue. But, you know, there was, there was a dark side to it. For everybody, there was a dark side to it. Yes, um, with the run that he took up, um, the, I mean, he took up Glen Ormiston and the sisters. Mm. Um, sisters and uh, can you tell me a bit about what the country looked like when, when he arrived there, yes. what his descriptions of it were like? Well, I can, but he describes it as parkland. And I think he's probably gilding the lily because he, he's writing the journal with an idea to sending this home. And every letter is going to his partner. So he's always telling them positive things about the land. There may be some things he doesn't hide, but on the whole, um, he does say in one wonderful piece of description, what a beautiful country the only problem is they haven't cleared away the dead trees, you know. And so you, you can't really, I feel that this idea of the parkland, some people would say, okay, that's because the Aboriginal custom was to burn off the pasture. Maybe that created a parkland with only the big trees left. So, you, you know, you have various possible interpretations. But my feeling is that, that um, the, the, the countryside looked pretty scruffy compared to what we would think and mm. what the lyrical paintings of the time tend to suggest. But I, I guess the critical thing was that it, it was fairly open countryside so that you could graze sheep and cattle there immediately. It, it, didn't, it didn't need yeah. to be cleared. Well, I think that's a mixture because across the plains it was clear, but uh, around Mount Nurit and certainly to the south, uh, at Turang mm. and so on. I think it was probably very heavily wooded. And once you go down to Timboon, it was very heavily yes, wooded. Yes. So uh, ha he did have to do a lot of clearing. Merida Yaluk, which is the next door run, was mostly wood, I think, when mm. it was first settled. Yeah, yeah certain, so, certainly the further south you go. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, just to say, Turang, for example, late Turang, he says, the banks are so wooded that I won't be able to use it for a cattle station until we burn them off. And so it's another example of expelling the native population, but also of having to create a pathway to the bank in order to use the water for the cattle. Mm. One of my favourite little anecdotes from early on in the book is 
when um, John Manifold, you know, there's the Manifold family around Camperdown, and uh, he was working with some men on the banks of the Purin Yalak Creek when he saw a man in a top hat and, and, and a black um, a, a tail coat uh, riding along. The Purin Yalak Creek was in flood, as it was in flood on Monday when I drove past, and I, it really reminded me of the, of the story. And, uh, and he, he saw the man take off his clothes and, and swim across with his horse across the Purin Yalak Creek. And it, it must have been quite a flood because the Purin Yalak Creek is not big. But uh, it's a wonderfully vivid image. Yes. But, but it, it shows, I guess, that he had, had a sense of um, propriety. I, I think so. I think he wanted to make a clear distinction between himself and the more kind of... The, he, he writes very disparagingly about the squatters who live in the bush and, and did love to rough it in a detestable fashion. You know, he comments on this as really slumming it and really, he wants to uphold his standards. He wants a respectable community at Glen Ormiston. He has wives of his shepherds there. He wants them to live, you know, in a, in a good way. He doesn't want drunkenness. So he, he sets a standard. But I think also we have to remember that he's always riding off to Melbourne to wait on Mr. Latrobe to complain about his neighbors who are always intruding over his boundaries or trying to establish a new settlements on his boundary. And he's, it's 130 miles and you know he can't take a change of clothes so he goes to Melbourne in the clothes that he would be, expect to see Mr. Latrobe. So of course he doesn't want them to be ruined <laughs> crossing the Perigiana Creek. He takes them off, puts them on, wraps them in a knot on his saddle, swims across, puts them on again, and off he goes. So I do think it's rather... And actually, um, Rolf Baldwood mentions that most of the squatters dressed one way, and there were a few that wore the clothes of the old country. And I say to myself, well, I know who that was. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you mentioned before about the difference in age between um, Black and a lot of the other squatters. Uh, Rolf Baldwood, um, also better known by his real name as Tom Brown, perhaps, um, was 17 when he took up 45,000 acres uh, of, his, of his run, which is quite a lot further west than... Yes, than Ed, Captain Eddington's son at 16 yeah. took up the management of his run. Mm. So it, some of them were very young indeed. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, you know, Neil Black in that sense was, was different again. Um, Neil Black, you know, starting off as a tenant farmer in life, he died a very wealthy and successful landowner. But what were the biggest challenges, would you say, that he faced you know, it, it, in making the transition from, from a, a youthful tenant farmer to being a uh, you know, grand what, old man? Yeah, <laughs> squatocracy. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I think that one of the, the features that, that I think is remarkable is the loyalty of his staff, his loyalty of his employees. He runs a very tight ship. And if those of you come and look at the uh, archive material, you'll see that there's one station journal. It daily, the superintendent must make a daily entry every day. And uh, who's in, been employed, who's working, what they're doing. He runs a very tight ship. And I think he was uh, actually, in spite of being quite a stingy old Scot, he was a generous man to his employees. He paid them extra for, he encouraged them to save, he helped them set up as squatters. Later in the selection era, he helped some of them to select. So, to, you know, so he, he, he wanted to encourage those people. So I think uh, in periods when all, for example, in the gold rush, all the uh, men would rush to the diggings, um, he, his people stood fast, not all, but you know, pretty much he was very lucky to have a very loyal workforce. And the, the manager who ran his uh, Mount Nora property at the end of his life, later on wrote to his daughter-in-law saying, I kept every single letter Neil Black wrote to me. I think that tells you something. So that's one of the things I think that he was really, he was obviously a very uh, good employer. He was a very good businessman. He, 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 you know, the, because he, you, and other things you'll see in the archive will indicate the degree to which he kept records, and he was very canny. And when it came to the selection era and the land acts, my God, the the shenanigans that went on. I mean, you know, even though he writes saying, "I regret the descent into immorality and corruption," but never mind, I've mastered it. You know, it's uh, rather like that. So. Um, 
he was, you know, he, he, did, he was a guy of many, many different uh, qualities. So I think that um, really is, many, many people went by the wayside. I think the Kurdis during the, the selection era went into terrible debt. A lot of squatters went into debt there that they never shook off. And he somehow managed to keep his head above water. Yes, um, in 1850, Black went home to Scotland and he stayed away for seven years. Um, and this was at a, you know, what was a fairly critical time in many ways for, for his, uh, his run back in Australia with the gold rushes and then the beginning of the push to break up the, the squatting estates. Um, why did he go, to go home and why did he stay away so long? Well, he went home to get a wife. And uh, obviously he also went home to report to his partners. But, but everybody, he first of all uh, went back to get a wife in, uh, seven years earlier in 1843 and the mission failed. And you get the feeling that he behaved rather disgracefully and left a very bad reputation behind of somebody who led people up the garden path and dumped them or whatever, you know. Anyway, so in 1850, when they have security of tenure and he's built his first sort of decent solid house and his nephew Archie is staying with him as a sort of apprentice, he decides that there is time to go home at the beginning of 1850 and he'll get back in time for separation, July the following year. Because after all, nothing to do with issuing of leases to the squatters or any other major thing is going to happen until Victoria becomes an independent colony. So he sets off in January 1840, 1850, and it plaintively, Archie writes to say, come back, come back, I'm gold, the gold rush, this, that, and the other. And, and he writes to his partner, Gladstone, and Gladstone writes back to Archie, I'm afraid the w lady is still waiting. He is still waiting for the lady to make up her mind. I never find out what lady, but anyway, this goes on and on, and finally Gladstone writes back and says, I'm afraid he will not come back without a wife, and he's too fussy, and I don't think he's ever going to find one. <laughs> and then finally, the partners get really very alarmed with Archie's expenditure. Archie becomes, spends money like water, probably for the, in the interest of the company. It actually works out very well, but you know, they are horrified because you know, they are not expecting him to buy all this land and spend all this money. So they go to see Neil and they say, look here, you have to go back. And within two months, he's married. So that's how it all works out <laughs> in the end. <laughs> and and, and uh, I think it's fairly yeah. interesting that the marriage seems to have turned out very successfully. Brilliant. Yes, she's 30 years younger than him. And I think, you know, he says to her, don't worry, it's only a year. We'll just go back to Melbourne. I'll just sort it out, put Archie in his place, and then we'll come back and live, you know, on the Clyde. But actually, of course, once he gets back, it is no question he's going to stay. But um, she... Is she is the daughter of somebody who is a self-made man, like her husband, and who came from a very modest background and became very grand and wealthy. And uh, the wife was born in Newfoundland. So there's a colonial background and there's this uprising background. And I think she's game for it. She's really terrific. And he relies on her a lot. Also, he's a he doesn't seem to have any problem about relying on her. She often writes his letters when he's not well. She, you know, she's a really competent person, as well as being providing him with three sons. You can't ask for more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so Black returned to Victoria to find that uh, you know, he'd, he'd left it. It had been uh, ruled by uh, Governor La Trobe, but as a subsidiary, if that's the right word, of New South Wales. So therefore, Governor Gipps in New South Wales is also important. But uh, he returned and Victoria is a self-governing, I wouldn't quite say democracy, but it's certainly heading that way. Uh, um, what was his reaction to the, the changed situation? Well, he was horrified. <laughs> because he obviously, when he rose in the world, he rose in the world hoping for it to be the same world that he, as it were, aspired to belong to, which would be a landowning and, you know, mildly democ mildly patricians, sort of not, the word, democ the word democrat or democracy in those days rather uh, had a feeling of the French Revolution. So it was a, a word of abuse, actually. It was a word of horror. Um, and so he really felt that things like manhood suffrage and 
um, you know, the, the, we, we, uh, the, the, that kind of thing. He would describe as things like mobocracy. Actually, it's a word I used with Brexit, I have to say. It seems to me that we are back in the world, world of mobocracy. But anyway, so he, he felt that uh, he, he felt that the, the squatters had deserved some of the opprobrium that was poured upon them. He knew all about this because before he came back, he read all the newspapers. They were always sent to him in, in Scotland, so he read the newspapers. He knew what was going on. I think that was one of the reasons he didn't want to come back. Um, but anyway, then he felt that if the squatters were uh, going to complain about this, that he, they ought to take upon themselves the onus of representing their interests in Parliament, and that's why he stood for the Legislative Council. And he was a reluctant politician, and I think a rather poor politician. But he, he, he did insist, and I think with some truth, that he did it in the public interest, in his view of the public interest. Yes, so democracy... <laughs> Uh, led fairly immediately to the Selection Acts. Um, would you like to just outline briefly, and we have touched on them before, but just mm. outline briefly what the Selection Acts were all about and what the consequence was? The Selection Acts, it's a very difficult one. Selection Acts were um, as a result of the huge immigration in the gold rush period and the fact that um, the possibility of making a great killing out of gold was very limited. There were a lot of people who were aspiring, if you like, middle-class uh, people who were not going to be labor. They were not going to be working labor on, you know, of that kind. They wanted to have a sort of respectable means of livelihood. And the image of the, the small farmer nestling in the kind of English village was one that appealed. But unfortunately, the Australian landscape is not uh, really uh, given to that kind of, it's not suitable to the English village, in little, lovely little settlements everywhere. But unfortunately, the selection acts, which were, I, I think, a genuinely good idea to introduce the possibility of the more modest uh, applicant having a chance of the patrimony and having a piece of land, but I think they were done in a way which were comp was completely unrealistic. And as a result of that, the selection became a kind of business, especially in more distant areas where there weren't many, no markets, no railways, no uh, possibility to make a serious uh, living out of farming in the small scale manner. Um, and so the upshot of that was that the squatters found people were uh, supposedly entitled to select in the middle of their runs and their runs were being broken up into a patchwork and so they they really were determined to buy all the land they could on their own runs. And so, in a way, they, they managed to evade the Selection Acts. And I, I think that it was fair that they overdid it, but I also think that the, the people who, who were the masterminds of selection were completely unrealistic. So it was a very troubled era and a lot of, uh, a lot of corruption, people buying, competing at the auction room just to drive the squatter up and then get him to buy from them at a highly inflated price. I mean, it was a whole, it was rather like a sort of hedge fund world, sort of, you know, shadowy transactions of all sorts of, you know, land sharks dealings and all the local auction auctioneers were involved and the surveyors were fiddling the books and so on. So it was a very unpretty and tricky era. But, uh, you know, people did their best to, to, get through it, to get through it. And there were some genuinely good selectors and true landsman selectors and I think Black wanted the people like that to settle. Yes, uh, but uh, not enough. One of the highlights uh, next door uh, is, the, is, is the map that was prepared of, uh, of his, his properties and uh, you know, the, showing the patchwork of land that he was able to buy and land that he wasn't able to buy and so on. And uh, you know, it, it really made the whole place a, a real hodgepodge. But you know, the, the reality was that the Selection Act largely determined the shape of uh, rural Victoria for, well, even up to the present. I, my wife's uncle had a farm on what was part of Glen Ormiston, and the boundaries of it were set in the 1860s mm. by the Selection Acts. Um, now, I think it's just about time that we mm -hmm. wound up our chat to give uh, time for the audience to participate. So, um, while there are many, many more things we could explore, um, I think we'll let the audience perhaps determine which areas that we do explore. So, um, so we have a bit of time now for questions.
Ricky, how, how long was it before the partners got a return on their investment? And that was quite a, a risky thing to do, considering it's 12,000 <coughs> miles, isn't it? Mm. Um, uh, to put money in, into an enterprise that they can't supervise. So, yes. how many, was it years? Or? Yes, it was years. I think they thought there would be a quick killing, and it was completely the opposite. First of all, he arrived at the height of the boom, and then there was a crash. So I think um, they probably didn't make any money for about 10 years, or maybe a little bit, but he, you know, he had a salary, so he had to be paid, and he kept asking for more capital, and could you please send me Durham Bulls? I don't know, I mean, it was extraordinary, because when you look at, the, he came with 6,000, the run cost him four. You know, I don't know how he managed it, really. You know, then there was the depression, I don't know how he managed it, but eventually, by, uh, because he was keen on cattle rather than sheep, he bought a lot of cattle in the late 40s, which in the early gold rush period, the price of meat shot up. And that's when, in the 50s, they really had huge returns coming in. So that was why another reason why he was able to stay in Scotland, because for once, the partners were not complaining. Because the partners were always complaining. You know, you haven't sent us enough money. This was supposed to be a, you know, a venture for you know, our pockets to be filled. Where is the, you know, there was a lot of trouble. But you know, when it takes six months or three months for the letter to arrive and go back, you know, actually, he could pretty well do what he liked, as long as he could get away with it. So, but it was a long time, it was a long time. Hi, you just mentioned that the um, gentleman, Mr. Black, um, purchased his run. Could you help me understand the difference between his run and then the Squatters Act and how they had sure. access to breaking up his land? Okay. okay. Yes. That when one talks about a run being on the market in 1839, 1840, it means that the sheep are on the market. The sheep and what they call the improvements. The improvements would include the hut, they would include a sheep wash or any dam or any wool shed or anything like that that's been built, and maybe hurdles. You didn't have any fencing then, but you know. So what you bought was essentially the grazing. You didn't buy the land, you bought the grazing. And you had to have enough stock. You couldn't ask, you couldn't license for your 10 pounds more land than you could depasture, as they say. So if you had so many thousand acres, you must have so many thousand sheep. And therefore, that would be, you know, outstation one would look after that flock, outstation. And, you know, it would be, depend on how many sheep you had and how many outstations you had, which you could try legitimately to claim a certain boundary. And, if, and foster fans always used to complain that black um, didn't have enough stock, for, and he didn't to begin with. And when foster fans used to call, he used to say, let's go out and look at the sheep over there, then they'd come back, have lunch, and meanwhile the shepherd would take the sheep off, and then he would take it, say, now look, at, there's a very good flock out of this. You know, he was a you know, little bit of wool spinning. But it was all dependent on the pasture. So that was... When later they surveyed the land, then they would value it according to whether it was bad land, good land, agricultural land, and that's when they began to divide it into allotments and sections and put it on the market. Maggie. Maggie, thank you very much for a really most enjoyable and interesting talk. I'd just like to... Um, you, you've actually talked a lot of, about the early part of, of his life in, in the Western District, but not what happened at the dissolution of the partnership and afterwards. So perhaps would you, would you like to just mention why the, the partnership dissolved and anything else you might happen to say? Thank you. Yes, the partnership uh, kept... Re when the partnership started with five-year terms, five-year terms, five-year terms, and when he came back in 1858, the partners had said in Scotland, we wish you to go back and prepare to divide the assets of the company. And at that stage, Archie was a, his nephew was a, a partner. Archie was bought out, 
uh, by being given some land and, and so on. He was bought out. So the three of them were left, and they again renewed the partnership deed. And then the, the idea was they would divide the assets by in, nine, in 1867. And um, uh, uh, Black did his best to create of the sisters and Glenormiston three estates of roughly equal value. You couldn't say equal acreage because, of course, some was improved, some was better land, some was worse land, and so on. So that was um, the idea. And before he left, before he came back, they'd already decided that um, they would draw f the three different, they would have three different pieces and they would draw lots. They would literally take straws, you know, they would draw straws. And um, when he came back, he didn't expect to stay. Then after he came back, he built his house, Glenormiston, on the, the most developed of the plots, and he expected the partners you know, if he could if get them the equal value to let him have his choice, i.e. his home. And uh, one of the partners, not Gladstone, who was happy to exchange in any uh, circumstance, but the other partner, Finley, refused to exchange. He drew the homestead lot uh, estate and refused to exchange. And the implications were that he, as a grand proprietor in Scotland, could not trust a man who he regarded as the equivalent of a dishonest factor on his estate. So he just didn't, he just, I don't know whether he was led on by other voices to, to, to think that black was untrustworthy or whether it was the general amorality of life in uh, Victoria at that time. Um, but anyway, he didn't believe that there was an equal value to the uh, estate. So black had to leave his homestead um, he, he said to Gladstone, what would you feel like if my son displaced you from your home and you had to start again on the moor or hillside behind you? And that's how he felt. And so he came to Melbourne. I think it was probably for the family's good, actually, because the boys then were able to go to school. And um, he lived in Melbourne for some years before later building Mount Nurit House and moving back into the Western District in the years before he died. Yes, T. S. Gladstone was the first cousin of Prime Minister William Gladstone. Yeah. And actually, it, another thing I always enjoy is you can always tell at one stage, Gladstone, when he was a rising politician, he was the colonial secretary about 1844, 45. And suddenly, Black's letters take on a kind of very grandiloquent, you know, tenure. We in this colony are, you know, this. And, and you can tell he's really written it for Gladstone to send on to his cousin at the colonial office. I don't think he does, but, you know, he's trying to widen the audience. We are being hard done by. We are the backbone of this economy. Why are we not being given our leases? You know, things like that. So, you know, I think the squad has had a difficult time in the beginning. It, you know, we, as, as Peter has said, we, we, we think of them as, you know, in their heyday. But in their early days, it was a pretty tough life. Um. Well, I think it's about time that we were winding up so we can go and have a look at these wonderful documents in the next room. But there's just one last question I might ask just to finish off with. And all biographers develop a relationship with the person that they're writing about. Um, some, sometimes it's admiration, sometimes it's... Uh, you, know, you read a biography and obviously the person just hates the person they're writing about. But... Um, you started off with a relationship with your subject as a great granddaughter, but how did that relationship change while you were while you were researching yeah. and writing? That's very interesting. You know, when I started, <clears throat> I had a very um, folkloric picture. You know, if you're raised as the great granddaughter of a pioneer, my mother used to say, "Now you're just going to burst into tears. Don't forget, you're the great granddaughter of a pioneer." You know, <clears throat> so so you know, I had this picture of this. Uh, person. And when I used to read in the archive, the first year I was reading in the archive, <coughs> excuse me, I think I better just have a sip of water. <coughs> I was really looking mostly at the family stuff, the relationship with Archie, the, you know, those kinds of things. And I found Black's behavior appalling. <laughs> 
And I used to go back home to Joanna and Gregoire, who uh, had me to stay, and uh, say, you can't believe this guy is absolutely impossible. But so, you know, you go through phases. And gradually, <coughs> I began to respect him enormously and to forgive him his irascibility and his bullying to, of Archie. And, you know, I think like Margaret Kittle, in the end, I really began to love the old boy. And, you know, I think that his own family probably used to feel, oh dear, the caged lion is at it today. You know, but I think he's a really marvelous figure. So, you know, I, I think it shows in the book that I really, in the end, think he's a, he's a great guy. Yeah, well, I think that's probably a very good note to finish on. Thank you very much, Maggie. Thank you.